Good morning. It's good to see all of your faces here as we gather and prepare for our time of worship. As we look at our announcements for the coming week and beyond, um, just uh, be aware of a couple things. Of course, uh, Vacation Bible School will be here before we know it. And uh, we've got, I think, most of the team assembled to help teach and lead the kids, but we're still in need of volunteers to help provide uh, cookies. So we are in need of cookies with uh, no nuts is all we ask, but uh, if you can help, that would be great with that. Um, that, again, will be coming up from July 12th through the 16th. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, um, though the bulletin doesn't reflect it, but remember next week, next Sunday, is, of course, July 4th. And because of it being the holiday, uh, we, were, we will only have one worship service it will be at 9.30 that morning here in the sanctuary. So help spread the word again. We will only have one worship service next Sunday at 9.30 here in the sanctuary. Um, with that, are there any announcements any of you have this morning before we begin? If not, I would invite you to please turn to the back of your hymnals to page number 848 and let us stand for our call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, in the Lord's word I hope. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with the Lord is plenteous redemption. Our hymn of praise is number 117.
And you may be seated. And I think we only have one for the children's sermon, but would you like to come up? Or We have a couple more back there, I see. Okay, great. Alrighty, this is wonderful. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. Glad that all of you are here this morning. Um, before we begin, you may have heard this knock knock joke, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Knock knock. Interrupting cow. Moo. <laughs> How many of you, uh, when, like when you're in school, whether it's Sunday school or in class or maybe even at home, when there's a bunch of you together, how many of you have heard or had the rule where in order to speak, you got to raise your hand first? Because have you had to do that before and raise your hand? Like, yeah, yeah. Why do we do that? People don't interrupt. Right, right. That's kind of rude when people interrupt, don't they? That, that's because we're trying to say something, and when someone interrupts, it kind of sends the message what we're trying to say isn't as important as what the person is interrupting is trying to say. And, and that is, that's just good, good, good manners, isn't it, in a way? Well... The story that I'm going to be reading later from the Gospel of Mark, it, it's actually a couple, two or three different stories in one. But what, it, what it's about, it starts off with Jesus, and he's walking with a bunch of people around him, his disciples and a bunch of followers, when this man by the name of Jairus, now Jairus would be kind of like what we think today, he'd be kind of a, a leader in, in the synagogue which is where, of course, Jewish people worship. He was a leader. Well, he had a young daughter who was very sick and close to death. And he comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus to come see her and hopefully heal her. So Jesus agrees, and they start walking. And they're walking towards Jairus' house. But as they're walking, and again, there's all these crowds of people. Now, any idea what Jesus, what type of clothes they would have wore back in Jesus' time back then? Any idea what they would have wore? Would it have been clothes like we wear today? Probably not. No, what they would have wore, the men, you know, the, the men especially even would have wore kind of like, they'd kind of look like robes or, or, or tunics as they're called. They, they'd kind of wear these robes or tunics, these kind of long garments. And a lot of times they'd either go barefoot or they wouldn't have shoes. Now, what I have here, this is something that our Jewish brothers and sisters wear a lot of times. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's what's called a prayer shawl or as they would say, a tallit. And this is a garment that they, they wear, especially when they're praying. Now, how, and how you're supposed to wear it is, you see up here, um, can you see this right here? Do you see there's a label, it kind of looks like a label, but there's writing on it. Do you see that there? You see the writing on that? Any idea what kind of writing that is? Have you, have you ever seen anything like this? This is Hebrew. And what's on there is a, is a prayer. And what they do when they wear these is the, is the person wearing it takes it, and a lot of times they'll read this prayer to themselves before they put this on. They'll take it, they'll read the prayer, which again is all in Hebrew, but basically it's, it's kind of a prayer of blessing is what it is. They read and pray the prayer, and then they will take this, and using this kind of as a front, they take and they wrap it around themselves. Now, a lot of times, some, 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 but some of them will sometimes completely wrap themselves, and they'll go like this and wrap it all over their head, and then they take it to one side and then take it to the other. Others will just put it on. It just kind of depends on, on their, their, their beliefs as Jewish people. But 
whether they do completely wrap themselves up at first or not, they eventually will then put it over their kind of shoulders like this. Now, the ones like Jesus would have wore probably would have been a little bit bigger. This is kind of a smaller sized one. But you notice, do you see the little tassels here? Do you see these, these little tassels there? Do you see the long ones there on the corners? There are four tassels, one in each corner. And they're meant to remind when a person wears this, these tassels are there to kind of remind us of some of God's commandments. But they would have wore these, and they would have worn them in a way so that all four tassels would have come around their body where you have two in front and the other two in back. Jesus probably would have been wearing something like this that day as he walked through that crowd. Now, if you saw somebody, maybe especially your mothers or grandmothers, they might wear a, sh a shawl. But when you see somebody wearing something like this, do you have the temptation to run up and pull one of their tassels? Do you have the temptation to do that? You ever had the temptation? To, you've never had temptation to do that? Well, in the story in a little bit, there was a woman who was walking behind Jesus. Now, she had an illness. For, for quite a long time that was very painful to her and she thought Jesus could maybe heal her the problem was was because of her illness she wasn't supposed to be near other people but she took a chance hoping that maybe Jesus could just heal her so as he's walking in the crowd she comes up behind him be from behind him now one of you be her and come up and grab just just pull on one of the tassels in the back just do that once if one of you want to And you see, Jesus was walking. Now, I, can, I can't see you, but I can feel that you pulled on, my, on the tassel. Well, Jesus felt that for a moment. He not only felt her pulling at the back of his garment like that, but he also could feel the, a sense of power leaving his body. Now, there were all of these people. There were probably several hundred people around him. And when he feels that, he turns around and he says... Who just, who, just touched my, who just touched me? What kind of reaction do you think he got out of the crowd when he said that? They actually were kind of laughing when he said that because they thought that was kind of funny because there were so many people surrounding them. Everybody couldn't help but touch one another because they were so crowded together. And so he turns around and says, who touched me? That's kind of like the question of how do you find a needle in the haystack? They laughed because they thought he was joking, but he wasn't. Well, the woman who touched him, she became more fearful. Because again, number one, she shouldn't have been there because of her illness. But for her to run up to him and touch him like that, she was putting herself in a lot of danger. She could really get in a lot of trouble and even get arrested for doing that. But she has the courage to finally say, it was me. What do you think happened to her after that? What do you think happened? Any idea? Well, let me tell you, first of all, from the moment she touched Jesus, she was healed from, from her affliction, that she was instantly healed. The second thing, do you think she was punished for reaching out and touching Jesus? Do you think she was? What do you think Jesus said? Any idea? When, when he asked a question and the woman came forward and she said, it was I, Jesus didn't chew her out. He didn't punish her. He didn't tell the guards or whoever to have her arrested. What he said to her was, and he called her this, he called her daughter. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. And that's all he said. And then he continued his journey on to Jairus' house to heal, well, when he got to Jairus' house, what do you think happened when he got to Jairus' house? Any idea? When he got to Jairus' house, the crowd there told him that the daughter had already died. So there was no point in Jesus coming in. But Jesus didn't listen to him. He walked in anyway. And he told the little girl, she was about 12 years old, he told her to get up. And she gets up. She wakes up and she gets up. So Jesus not only healed one person, he brought another person back to life. Now, a couple things for us to remember. Number one, Jesus loves us and cares for us. And it doesn't matter who we are. 
This woman, the one that he healed first, we don't know a bunch about her. But whoever she was, regardless of her breaking the law by touching him, even though she was ill, Jesus, did, Jesus turned and loved her. He had compassion and he healed her. And then he went and he, and he brought Jairus' daughter back to life. Now, what we can remember is, now, we may not ourselves be able to heal people like Jesus did. But we can do probably some of the next best things. And one of the best things that we, we can do is always show love and kindness to everybody else. Now, I had hoped to bring something else this morning, but I couldn't find one right away. But have you, any of you know what a slinky is? Have you ever played with a slinky? Do you know what it is? You ever heard of a slinky? Any idea what a slinky is? Yeah. What? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's like, do you know what it is? Can you explain what it is? It's a spring. It looks like a giant coil or spring. And they're usually, you can stretch them out this way. And, and the fun thing about them is you could set one like at the top of the stairs here and then watch it and it would go down the steps. It would, it would go over once on itself and then it would bounce up and come back down and all the way till it got to the end of the stairs. The reason why it does that is in science we call it momentum. And so... We may not be able to heal like Jesus did, but what we can do is spread love and kindness to everybody we meet as we move forward. Just like the slinky that moves forward with momentum, we should always move forward with love and compassion to everybody we, we meet. Not just our friends and family and people we know, but even strangers. We should always show kindness. Will you join with me in a prayer, let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for always loving us and healing us when we are sick. And no matter who we are, you love us always. Help us to love one another just as you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, now, one thing to remember, we're, we'll have church next Sunday, but we won't have Sunday school next Sunday, and we're having church an hour early at 9.30, but just remember that. We'll have church school today, but and I, and I think Miss Pat has some special things for you to do today that I think you'll enjoy. But before you go, you can come and take a treat. I want to get two. You can. Go right ahead. I want to get two. You can have two. We've got plenty this morning. There you go. Whoop, got it. There you go. I, thank you. All righty. Thank you all. We again have much to be thankful for, and as a sign of our thankfulness, let us receive our morning offering.
prayer. Let us pray. God of boundless generosity, as we offer our gifts and our lives to you, help us to hear and heed your Apostle Paul. We long to grow as disciples so that we grow in generosity. The abundance we've been given has a purpose in your plan that we might know the joy of sharing that abundance with those in need. Long for that vision of your kingdom when loving hearts bring a better balance between abundance and need. In the name of Christ, our teacher and redeemer, we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. And we have come now to a time of sharing our joys and concerns. What joys or concerns do you have this morning? Yes, Marvin. Yes, my sister Valjean turns 89 today. Valjean turns 89 today. Well, we... You want to get <laughs> you you could you could you could just well that that and please share our birthday uh, blessings and greetings to her when you see her Marvin thank you for that are there other joys or concerns yes Ruth. Yes, yes, yes. We, yes, we want to congratulate all of them for their accomplishments and for McKenna, of course, Shadron and their victory yesterday as well. Just uh, a lot of wonderful things going on with our kids, and we are just blessed for the opportunities that, that they have here. Are there other joys or concerns? Yes. Yes. Yes, Joanne, as some of you may have heard, fell here uh, a, while, a little while ago, and she had been in Denver for surgery. She is back here in St. Francis. She is at the hospital. I just got a text in between services from Miguel and said she seems to be doing well. They were a little concerned when she got here. Um, they thought there were some potential heart issues going on, but... She seems to be getting her strength back, but I, I think it's going to be a long road of recovery for her. So we want to keep Joanne in our prayers, as well as the others whose names are mentioned there. Uh, of course, Sue Zimbelman, who, who had a horse accident, and all others whose names uh, appear. Another name I was asked to share that didn't get in the prayer list is Norris Anderson, and prayers for him as he is, uh, he is very ill at this time. Let us together join in this, our time of prayer. Let us pray. Our loving and gracious God, we are ever more thankful for the many, many blessings you have given us. And again, we thank you for your gift of creation, O oh God, and for how it sustains and provides for us. And we give you thanks for the ministry, teachings, the life, death and resurrection of your son jesus christ god we thank you for all that you have given and sustain us with lord in your mercy Amen. gracious god we though as your children have not always have not always lived in the ways that we should live with one another we have put up barriers of division against one another we have let our own selfish pursuits of the day be the ones that rule our lives and God causing us to not only be selfish but to ignore the cries of those around us who are in need, to turn our backs on our sisters and brothers. Heavenly Father, we humbly ask for you this morning to hum humble our hearts, to forgive us of our sins, God. And help us to know once again of that reconciling, redeeming love found in Jesus Christ. 
May we know of your great gift of grace and mercy, O oh God, that sets us free from all that is sinful and makes us alive to all that is good. Redeem us, heal us, reconcile us to you and to one another, O oh Lord, and help us so that we too may forgive one another. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Healing God, we also lift up those who are ill or hospitalized or recovering. We just pray, O oh God, that they may their well that they may be made well, that they may, may have strength. We pray for doctors, nurses, and others who tend to their care, O oh God. We, we lift up those names raised earlier and just ask that you be with each and every one of them, O oh God, for healing and strength in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we continue to lift up those who are in grief, who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Loving God, we just ask that you be near them. May they be comforted and again, know of your eternal word, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of the harvest, we, we thank you so much for the, the land that provides for us. And Lord, we we lift up those involved in this year's harvest as they prepare to go out into the fields. We, we just pray for their safety, O oh God. For their safety, not just out, out in the fields, but as they, they move back and forth from the various fields, those who are driving trucks and the combines and all the equipment that's needed, we, we just pray for their safety. And Lord, we, we thank you for their dedication that they they put in every year in a harvest that helps prepare or feed your people. We just lift them up and again pray for their safety. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do know, though, as, a, as, as always the constant risk is that of the weather. And Lord, we, we lift up those those in agriculture who've been affected by recent storms in our areas, and especially those who have lost crops. We just pray, oh God, for their strength uh, during this time. And uh, may they receive the help that they need to get them through these, these difficult times. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, we also lift up those people in those troubled places around our world where there is turmoil and strife. We especially lift up those in the Middle East God, we just pray for peace to, to, to be with them in some way, to be with the leaders of our nations. May they be guided by your wisdom and peace, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who have fallen victim to the recent building collapse in Florida, for others who, whose lives have been lost at the hands of, of, of nature, Michigan and other places, for those affected by wildfires in the areas of, of God, we just, uh, we just ask that you be with them and give them strength too as they look to rebuild their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up all of these names or any others that may remain yet in our hearts and in our minds that you ask that you receive and hear them all. And now, together as your people, together let us pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. On earth as it is. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us.
Testament reading for this morning is from 2 Samuel 1, verses 1 and 17 through 27. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jeshar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exalt. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in the life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain, your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan, greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful passing the love of women, how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Our first New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, And in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous understanding or undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift has, not according to what one does not have, I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Our gospel reading for this morning is taken from the gospel of Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came out and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with them. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. She was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, 
Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you look and say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May Almighty God bless to our hearts and minds this and understanding of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. You may remain seated as we join in singing our next hymn.
Will you please pray for me as I pray for you as we think and reflect upon our scripture passages together. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation in all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our refuge, a very present help in trouble. Amen. Well, I am sure all of you at one time or another have probably seen these. And what I'm talking about are these when you're flipping through channels, maybe late at night, and you come across one of these faith healing preachers, as they call them. Now, these are the guys, and there's many of them out there, and they're usually men, but there's been a few women too, I think. But usually they're the ones that, that as they stand there in a, in a gathering of people, ask people to come forward and share their afflictions, and they come up and they, they, they say a few words, and then they touch the person, and a lot of times the person falls back, and there are people behind them ready to catch them. And then for, for, for many of them, they get up and they feel heal, healed now. They're not only saved, but they feel healed. Now, I don't know about you, but I will admit that I, I have some skepticism when I see that. And these faith healers have been the fodder of many, many different jokes and humor through movies and even cartoons. Um, the cartoonist Gary Larson, who's created the Far Side cartoons, one of his cartoons, I remember, the caption simply read, Faith Appliance Healers. And what the cartoon showed, it showed this guy with slick back hair and a suit and tie. He's standing there in front of a group of people with a vacuum cleaner. And he's saying to the vacuum cleaner, to the demons who've clogged this vacuum cleaner, I command you to come out. And so those are some of the, of course, the, the, the humor we see. Well, that begs the question, then, what does this mean today when you look at our sermon title, Was Jesus a Comedian? Well, we'll get to that here in a moment. What we have today is a rather, not just one, but a couple very powerful stories that Jesus did as far as miracles. You see, you remember last week, Jesus, after being with the crowd of people, left with his disciples. They got in a boat and they crossed the sea to go to the other side. When they get to that other side, now the story that was left out that we didn't hear immediately preceding this passage in Mark today was when they get over there to the other side, that's when Jesus encounters the, 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 the demoniac. And if you remember that story, he, 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 he does kind of like, you know, he does command the demons to come out of that demoniac and he's healed. Once that's done, as we heard, this is where today's passage picks up at, they get in the boat and they cross back to the other side where they originally came from. They're now back there and there's a crowd of people gathering around. And one of the first persons to come up to him is a, is a, is a leader in the synagogue by the name of Jairus. Jairus was more than likely a Sadducee. Now, sad, you see, one of, their, one, one, one of their emphasis was, of course, on following the law, especially the purity codes. But Jairus comes to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, he says to Jesus, my daughter is very ill. Would you please come and see her and heal her? She is near death. Without so much of, of, of an afterthought, Jesus does just that. They start walking towards Jairus' house, but the crowds of people follow. And there, again, was, was, was a great number of people, probably several hundred. Many of them were there out of curiosity. Some were just there to, to see who this person was that they probably heard already quite a bit about. But there were some there that day in that crowd who were more than likely at the end of their rope. They suffered from affliction, from illnesses and pain. And they tried many, many different cures and remedies to no avail. Saw many, many doctors or people that thought could help them. And there just was no relief. 
And one of them was this woman. We don't know her name. We just know that she suffered for 12, 12 years of hemorrhaging. And I imagine tried everything she could think of, saw every specialist or person she thought could help her. And her one last hope was this person she heard about, this, this guy who, who had a history of being able to heal people. And maybe, just maybe, he could help her. The problem was for her, from her suffering from the hemorrhaging, because of the purity laws that were in, in force, she should not have been near any groups of people. She shouldn't have been near anybody in the public, but there she was. I imagine out of desperation because, like many people who are faced with conditions like that, was probably at the end of her rope. But she sees Jesus, and she decides to take that daring yet dangerous step of approaching and to help minimize what could possibly happen, she decides to approach him by walking up behind him. And as we heard, she goes up behind him and touches part of his garment, pulls on it. And it is that moment when she touches him that she can feel herself, her affliction leaving her body and that she's now healed. But not only that, as we heard, Jesus could tell too. He felt the pull of his garment, and then he felt the power that he had leaving his body. And as he feels that and experiences that moment, he stops, and he turns and looks. He looks behind him, and he says, Who just touched me? And I only imagine some of those close to him who heard him say that probably thought it was a joke, and they laughed at him. Even the disciples, they're like, what are you talking about who touched you? You're like surrounded by several hundreds of people. They're all crowded together, and you, you, you think somebody touched you? That's all these people are doing are touching you. What makes, what are you asking, a joke here? But no, Jesus was serious. He knew something extraordinary just happened. Well, the woman she knew too. And she grew in fear because not only, even though she was healed, she was putting herself in danger because when Jesus stopped and asked, she knew for a, in an instant that, that she had been found out. And if he knew that someone touched him in the midst of all these other people who were reaching for him, then she had to know that he knew it was her and that she soon would be outed for such an act. So rather than try to avoid it, she comes clean and just says, it was I. I was the one who touched you, Lord. She rather admitted it and was prepared to face her consequences because, again, she shouldn't have been there that day close to the public, let alone touching a, another person, especially someone like Jesus. And so she was, I imagine, fully prepared to face whatever consequences, but there were none. Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't chastise her. He didn't question her or do anything more to embarrass her other than he simply says to her, he addresses her as daughter and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. And without as, 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 as such a, as, as of an afterthought or anything else, Jesus continues in his journey to Jairus' house. And we hear the second powerful story. When he gets there, he's told that, that the daughter has since died. And, and those there say, well, there's, no much, there's not much reason for Jesus to come in. But he does. And he goes in and he sees everybody weeping and crying and in mourning. And he asked the question, why are you all weeping? Why is everybody mourning? And then he says, she's not dead. She's simply sleeping. And as we heard directly in the scripture, here's the second point where, well, is Jesus still trying to be that comedian? I imagine some were thinking, well, if he's trying to be funny, he's not that funny right now. But nevertheless, some of the crowd that were there laughed. Probably a laughter of, 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 of just astonishment. 
Because it was very clear this, this daughter, this young girl was dead. And people are mourning. They're clearly upset and, and, and shaken by this death. And this man comes in and has the, has the audacity to say, oh, she's just sleeping. How dare he? How dare he minimize this situation of ours? But Jesus was serious because he then says, get up. And the daughter wakes up from her sleep and gets up. And then he looks at everybody around who gathered and saw this, and he told them not to tell anybody. And then he says, and by the way, get her something to eat. You see, Jesus was showing his compassion during all of this. He had compassion on this anonymous woman. Again, we don't know much about her, but we know from the moment she touched him, the courage that had to take, she was healed. And instead of embarrassing or having her punished in some way for breaking the law, he tells her that her faith has made her well. And then he goes to Jairus' house and brings back to life this young girl and says, you know, again, don't tell anybody about this, but make sure she has something to eat. Now some scholars, preachers, Make the, and, it, and I admit it's an interesting, it, it's, a, it's a convincing argument. I'm not quite so sure about it myself, but I can see the point. And I'm, like I said, I'm not quite so sure. But the argument is, is that maybe that the, the hemorrhaging woman could possibly be this young girl's mother. And it makes sense because when you think about it, we are told that the hemorrhaging woman suffered from her affliction for 12 years and this girl was 12 years old. So was the hemorrhaging as a result when she, she gave birth to this girl? Possibly. And it's, you know, it's, it's rather convincing to know that, to think that. But it could be just a coincidence. We, we don't really know. I would say this, whether we believe the connection is there or not, even if there isn't a connection between the two, more than what we read, it still doesn't take away from the powerful stance that this, these two stories bring to us. Now here's the thing we have to be careful of in this passage. You as well as I do know that not every illness or disease that we or our loved ones get can simply be healed. Many of us know the cruelty that Illnesses like cancer, like Alzheimer's and dementia. Diseases and afflictions that really have no known cure can do to, to, to our loved ones and ourselves. And a lot of times we think because of a loved one who died or suffers of this disease that they simply weren't healed because they weren't faithful enough or just didn't have enough faith or belief. And that, too, is one of the most cruelest things we can think of because it's not a question of faith. But we know that sometimes there just always, there just isn't a cure available. But that still doesn't take away, again, the importance of this story that helps us to know that in the midst of our lives, when we are at the end of our rope, there is always hope. A, a dear friend that I knew who was suffering from cancer once told me that. As I went to see her one day as she, as she laid there in her, in her bed, she knew death was near. But I remember what she told me. She said, you know, I wasn't cured of my cancer, but I'm okay with that. Because I've known every day that I've been afflicted with this, that there's been hope. The hope made alive in the people who've come to see me who've loved me and reminded me of that love, but most importantly, the love that Jesus has for me. That's the hope I have. And you see, this, 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 these miracle stories may not necessarily give us the result we'd like, but I'd say they give us the hope. 
I don't often mix pop culture in with sermons, but I, I feel kind of compelled to today. There's been a series on CBS TV lately. It's been on since, I think, early April. It comes on on Thursday nights, and it's called U.S. of Al. And the synopsis of the, of, of the series is basically about two, two, two war veterans who served together in Afghanistan. One is a Marine by the name of Riley, the other one is an Afghan interpreter who served right along with Riley and the other troops at the time as an Afghan interpreter who goes by the name of Al. And the premise of the show is that Al comes to live in the U.S. because by staying in Afghanistan, he's in danger. Because, and th this is actually a, a true situation. There are many Afghan interpreters who are targets of the Taliban because they've assisted U.S. troops. This series brings to life that, that story. And so Al comes to live with Riley and, and his family here in the U.S. And the most recent episode, the season finale, dealt with Riley and the, and the issues he's had since coming home from being in Afghanistan. And it starts out with him fighting and, and, and dealing with tinnitus, which you know is a constant ringing in one's ears. But he also, it's made known, many of the other problems he's suffered since coming back from Afghanistan. And the show deals with his refusal at first to seek help. But it isn't until he realizes just what he has at stake not just himself, but his family, including his own daughter, that he realizes he needs to take that step to get help. And so that's where the show leaves us and him trying to finally take that step to get the help that he has so long denied himself. When I think of this today's story that we heard in Mark, I can only imagine the people in our lives that we may know who have denied the help that they have so needed for so long, simply because they, they, they sought so many remedies and, and ways of healing that didn't happen. And they're at the end of their rope. Now, we may not be able to cure them with a touch of a few words like Jesus did. But our job as disciples of Christ now is to give one another hope. This story sets the powerful example of Jesus' compassion for others. Not just those who were the religious types who came to the synagogue and, and observed the laws, but for those anonymous people, even those who put themselves in great peril like that woman. Needless to say, it is Jesus who gives you and I hope. It is the risen Christ that gives us hope when everything around us seems to fail. It is the risen Christ who says to us, get up and try once again. It is the risen Christ when we, we, we mess up our lives in some way that says, well, you may have made a mess of your life, but no, I still love you and that you are forgiven, and you can always start over again. And it is the risen Christ that gives those who suffer from cancer, or Alzheimer's, or the other incurable diseases that are out there right now, that gives us the hope to still live the, our lives as best as we can, and gives us hope that even in the, in, in the last days, if the disease or our afflictions cause our death, that we still have the hope in the risen Christ. Thanks be to God for giving us these stories today that remind us of the miraculous healing found in Jesus Christ and the compassion that Christ had for all God's people that my hope is that we too can have and make a reality for one another in this kingdom of God that Mark so often discusses in his gospel. Thanks be to God and amen.
I ask you now, as you are able, to please stand and will you join with me in our closing hymn number 589.